Okay, there we go. Alright. I think this is where I'm supposed to put it. I don't know, but uh, good morning everybody. Good morning. Some of you may not know me. Um, my name is Blake uh, Donaldson. I've been coming here now for I'm gonna say actually since Gabriel was born, I think. So nine years, something like that. So this is like my fifth time doing this. And no matter what, this is nerve wracking. <laughs> it's been a couple years since I've done the last one and, and uh, I still am nerve wracking. I was talking to myself all the way here, basically trying to like calm my nerves, everything like that. So, um, so before we start, let's get into prayer and uh, give God thanks for the day. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for today. I want to thank you for everyone here. I want to thank you for um, anyone that uh, outside of here too that uh, couldn't make it or that may be watching at another time. But we just want to thank you overall for the body of Christ. As uh, again, as for we need one another. So as times we are in right now, um, and just for any struggles that we might be having, that we can lift each other up, edify one another, build, build each other, and strengthen one another. Um, we want to thank you again for these opportunities for people that want to learn how to teach or that uh, want to teach something that they have um, learned and grown in and applied to their life so that others can uh, um, be uh, to learn also, Lord. And so we want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for your grace, mercy, love, and truth. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Um, so as for most of you that do know me, um, I enjoy exercising, and it, I know that if I could drop my body off though at a gym and be able to lift and do all that and then pick it up later, I'm fine with that too. Um, but I enjoy lifting, and uh, um, that's why I have the shirt on. Kind of goes along with my message. Uh, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, come with me if you want to lift. Huh? <laughs> I could do a better one, but right now. <laughs> Um, tried practicing as much as I could, but um, but again, I enjoy lifting, but I also enjoy eating. <laughs> so sometimes it's taking two steps forward, one step back, taking uh, maybe another step forward, but three steps back. Um, I basically have family, job, um, injuries that I could have, um, sports events, just life in general. So if I would have started this back in high school, I would have been way better off, but I only started this one about three or four years ago. So if I enjoy it, it's a great um, stress reliever. So when I come home from work, oh my gosh, it, it's something I go down there and I just, I do it. And it's, and with, you know, again with life with, and then having kids, that can be uh, sometimes nerve wracking as well. So, Do your uh, boys join you? Huh? Do your boys join you? Uh, I told them they can start learning how to do that when I was around 12 years old. So David has got five months, six, five months. And then he starts learning, he's looking forward to that, dumbbells, all that type of stuff. But I told him I want them to learn how to uh, um, body exercise first, kind of prepares for weights and things like that. So, um, so yes, they will be, but it'll be after I'm already done. <laughs> so, um, but it's, so it's hard to be consistent on that. But again, that's okay. Um, it's a good discipline and again that for a healthy lifestyle um, that I'm striving for so um, so it seems fitting to go along with my shirt and my message is there is some words in the Bible and some phrases exercise thyself is one of them um, if you want to turn to 1st Timothy uh, chapter 4 and uh, well we're gonna start with verse 1 Go to 11, but the focus verses are going to be 7 through 8. Now, again, there's other words that stand out. Uh, work out your own salvation. Work out, so in Philippians uh, 2.12. But uh, let's read, starting verse 1, and we'll go to 11. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. 
If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, and of good doctrine, whereon thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. So in the context of the chapter, you find those verses 7 through 8, exercise thyself, and then bodily exercise. So kind of now, if you look up the Blue Letter Bible, the exact word of exercise, it occurs 11 times in eight verses in the King James Bible. Now again, if you haven't used the Blue Letter Bible, I encourage you to do so. It has helped me tremendously. And when I first uh, was introduced to a Blue Letter Bible and just on study tools and resources that they, they have. Um, Pastor Brian does an excellent job, uh, again, showing how to do things, tricks, all that. David Reed is another one. He does that with his messages and his uh, question and answer teachings and things like that. And he actually, I think he does a few messages on how to uh, learn how to use the Blue Letter Bible and tricks and tips behind it. But um, so this is part of how I used is I kind of did this for convenience. I just put in the verses that come up with that, the exact word usage. Um, now again, if you put in a different, let's say, exercised, you come up with some different other words. But, oh, sorry. I think I spent a little bit too much time to finding animation for all this. <laughs> so, exercise, what type of exercise is Paul referring to? Physical bodybuilding training. So we saw in that in verse eight, bodily exercise. Is that something that he's talking about? Uh, about the exercise unto godliness? Is that the, the type of thing? Um, so he uses physical exercise. He uses things like that as a metaphor in other verses as well. Um, so for, so as a more visual, but a kind of funny video, I was gonna put pictures of Arnold on there or Ronnie Coleman, but then I ran into this video and I just couldn't resist. I shortened it tremendously, okay? <laughs> oh, come on. Let's not do that. I'm Pamela Pupkin, and you're to do Pamela Pupkin's workout for the Lord. Woo. Hey, y'all, this is Alan, and this, these are the other people. resist on that one. So is this the type of exercise is being discussed in uh, eight, verse 8, the bodily exercise? Now again, you look at a lot of commentaries and something like that. I looked at the commentaries after I kind of did all this and I wanted to see what they were saying after I kind of came to my own conclusion on it. And some of them will actually say bodily exercise is one um, for a translation or uh, understanding behind it. But that is one of those things on that is uh, an option of what it could mean. Now, how about religious discipline or tradition and striving? Um, is that another bodily exercise? It's our flesh, things like that. So religious, these are some rituals and practices. So you got fasting, that's a religious one that's done either, you can do that by health wise, or you can do that with uh, on that now granted, you got that three day fast, you got a 21 day fast, you got all these fastings that they say that you need to do. If you're a Christian, you gotta do them. It's in some other uh, religions, 
will tend to uh, push that on people on doing that. Um, animal sacrifices, or even some places that will do human sacrifice, right? So you got this rituals, practices, uh, purif purifying, so cleansing yourself before a religious purpose, a pilgrimage, something like that. That could be another option. Um, but again, if you go to back to 1 Timothy 4 and read verse 3 again, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. So purifying is that you look at that forbidding to marry, you're, again, you're, you're being pure. You're not being uh, um, getting involved into a, um, where your focus is on God only and not your wife, and that could be also interfering on your focus. But again, is that something that, uh, in that sense of purifying, could be happening? Uh, fasting, abstaining from meats, um, just like what it talks about too, uh, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which know and believe the truth. Um, maybe he's referring to the Ten Commandments. How about the over 600 different laws that are in the Old Testament, or some others of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and, uh, traditions of men, laws of men. Um, is he talking about these type of religious exercises? Um, how about spiritual exercise? Is that what he's also talking about in these verses? Um, not all things are, again, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. Now, this is an image of uh, I found online. Not saying all these are dispensational, <laughs> okay? So, but I thought this was a pretty darn good listing, though, of some spiritual things that do kind of pertain to our life now, that we can do things that will, uh, uh, good disciplines that we can have in our life. And just like that, fasting and all that, no nourishment from God, very free of bodily. When I did this in the past, it did do those certain things. My... And it's nothing, again, I did this for wrong reasons. I did it because under the um, religiosity I was under back then, I was doing it more so I could hear from God and that I could cleanse things. That was, again, a past understanding. Um, but 11 day fast, I was just drinking water for 11 days. I broke the fast because somebody was having some chocolate and I didn't even think of it and I started eating it. I'm like, Hoo! and it wrecked me. So it basically, I was like, oh, well, my fast is broken then. Forget that. I'll start eating more. Well, that's part of the fasting on that point because I, even though they say health-wise, you're not supposed, you don't want to go past three days. That's going to be so damaging to your health. I actually, after three days, felt really good after just drinking water. And I delivered furniture still at that time. So I was sweating. I was doing all that stuff. And just, again, just water was all I had. But... Did it bring me any closer to God than what I am now? No. There's, there, there's nothing that can bring me closer. There's nothing I can find favor with God differently than what he's already found favor in me now. And it doesn't change. Um, you know, again, examine life in areas, break free of daily life demands. We can just do that just as a discipline, right? Just in things that we have daily life stuff, struggles, anxieties, and different things like that, memorization. That's a good one. <laughs> so these are just spiritual disciplines that we can just do um, on our own. Uh, or, so is he talking about some of these things, uh, or is he talking about a few of these concepts, or maybe all of them all together? Um, so if you're not already there, please turn again to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll begin at verse 1 again. But I'm going to do a very short to the point because to see those verses in the context of what they're talking about, you kind of see then well, again what 7 and 8 could be talking about as well. Um, so 1 Timothy chapter 1, or chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 1. Spirit, now the Spirit speaks expressly. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. Latter times, again, some shall depart from the faith. Latter times, speaking of just past when Paul was writing it, or it could be way down the line. Again, no matter what, for as much as he knew, is the same thing as we know now when the rapture of the church will happen, we don't. We don't know when that's going to happen. Okay? Um, so, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a high iron, referred also then to 1 Timothy 1.15 for that one as well, um, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which the verses say that God has created every creature for us to be received with thanksgiving. 
Verse 6 is, not, is saying that it is a good thing to be repetitive at times. Right? So, which I know I need more times than not, but you asked my wife that as well. Uh, Titus 2 8 says to affirm constantly. And there are other verses that say as well, because we are apt to forget. So, we need that constant reminder. And we can be slow to learn and remember things. Um, and so, we need to be constantly nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, because we do have profane fables and doctrines out there in the world that can even tempt and seduce the best of us no matter how long you have been believing as a Christian. There's people that have been there uh, believing for 30 years and then all of a sudden get seduced by something. It's, it's sad to see as why, I mean, there's some big names out there that have all of a sudden become atheists and just because they got seduced, they got, um, uh, um, got involved in or influenced, and again, of people that are around them or the doubts and things like that, or things in their life, and they just took those circumstances and just applied it as, oh, well, there's no God. Uh, that's not that's not true at all. So, how do we, in verse seven, refuse these profane, perverted, seducing, worldly, and carnal fables and doctrines? Well, how do we do that? Now, if you notice the color scheme, the different colors, the rainbow colors, and things like that. A lot of times in today's society, we see that a lot more, but unfortunately, it's for different movements. Um, and LGBTQ+, BLM, none of that, none of that can all be also summed up into, I don't know if you guys ever see a sign that says, we in the house believe, and then you got all the different things, and science is real, water is life, love is love, all that type of stuff. Um, and there are even some other movements under the banner of Christendom. They will also, but either way, there are many other movements opposite or perverted from God's word that can be described with those words. And remember, rat poison is 99.9% .9 good for the rat. That 0.1% is what kills it. So, <laughs> Satan knows how to dress up something to make it look good, right, and spiritual. Um, he's been at it since the Garden of Eden. He's not stupid. He's had much exercise uh, or practice in it. So then how do we then combat this? How do we refuse those kinds of doctrines and fables and not be deceived and seduced and taken heed to the devilish, carnal, religious world so we are no, so we or no, someone that is or could be departing from the faith because of it? We need to exercise ourselves unto godliness, like it says in the rest of verse 7. Um, and again, what kind of exercise and what does it mean to exercise unto godliness? And how is this godliness in verse 8? Uh, is it profitable unto all things unto this life and the life to come? Well, let's first dive quickly into that word exercise now. Now for your animation thing. I, I, next time I'm not doing that. <laughs> so for your convenience, I put a snippet of Strong's, um, um, I'm sorry. I got myself off track here. I got a lot of notes here, so I'm hoping to even get through this. Um, so for convenience, I put a snippet of Strong's lexicon, the exact Greek word used for exercise. And so now notice there is not an exact translation for it in Hebrew. Uh, even though if you look up exercise without exact match, it will come up with exercise like I was explaining earlier. Um, so as I went to other study tools, I believe I was able to pinpoint with what Hebrew word was used in which definition explains it by reading it in the context of the verse. So I put those over here on that. So Psalms, Jeremiah, and then again, the Gospels as that point still being great, but I, I was almost going to put like a dispensational line <laughs> after the Gospels and all that, um, just to kind of give you a difference of uh, uh, some different things of um, exercise in Old Testament and New on that point, rightly dividing that other section. Um, so, and again, this is the King James Bible we are talking about. So if you look in Blue Letter Bible, you look off to the side, you'll see all the different translations, they'll give different numbers and how many that word exercise is used. So if it interests you to see what other translations use for the different words and in the context and things like that, um, I encourage you to do so just to see that. Uh, if need be, see what changes they made to make it more understandable. Because like I said in other commentaries, they do look at bodily exercise in that verse as physical training. 
on that point. Well, maybe why is it that they look at that as physical training? Is it based on some of the different translations changing the words usage and understanding of some other verses that changes the whole context of the verse then? Um, so, I put another thing. So I also want to put the screenshots of the verses. They use the same Greek word in verses 7 and 8, which gymnaso, I think I pronounced that, gymnaso, the Greek understanding, or it's uh, uh, pronunciation, and which is used four times, which by the way, gymnaso is where the, uh, we get the word gymnasium in the English language. Um, and for the understanding of the part of speech, it is used, it's used as a verb. So I put this in it for a reason as well, and you'll see later. So again, it's the understanding of the English language and knowing what type part of speech that we, this is, I mean, this is going back to elementary and junior high and high school. You go back to those times where they teach you on the part of speech or something, well, there's reasons why. So we got feminine noun and verb for those same words exercise in the English language, but the Greek word usage for this is different on each verse. So gymnasia is used in the second, uh, and for the understanding of the part of speech, feminine noun. So this is the exercise from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Now remember the part of speech for the word exercises in verses 7 and 8? So again, we have verb and we got uh, noun. And again, as for um, where it's, you get the different uh, um, definitions and things like that. So you got all these different definitions for that exercise for the noun use of the part of speech. And then you got these different ones for the verb. So, feminine noun for verse 8, if you look at it, it's, where it's work, exertion. But notice number 2, what is religion? Is it works? Religion is based on salvation by your works? Is that what we need to do for salvation? No. So, in that sense, it's requiring work. So, verb for verse 7, if you look at that, is to train, to use. Okay? Um, to employ discipline, things like that, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Now, first of all, based on the word usage in the context of the verse, and you can do, disagree with me if you want, but this is my personal subjective opinion, um, and again, copyright Brian Ross on that one. I don't know if you guys ever hear that. Uh, and for people that know him on that too, you hear that personal, private, subjective opinion. I think that once I heard it, I was like, oh, it's brilliant. So, uh, <laughs> I believe exercise in verse 7 is talking about spiritual exercise and training. And exercise in verse 8, so that's that Bible, is talking more on the fleshly religious exercise, uh, which is referring, if you go back to verse 3, on those words, in the context of the verse, if you're looking at the bodily exercise, it's that fleshly religious type. Um, which, if you look in that, same, in that verse, though, too, he's not discounting it completely, is he? If you look at that verse 8, but bodily exercise profits little. So there is some little uh, use to it, right? Um, looked at, let's look at some other verses that would pertain to uh, the same kind of uh, exercising. Uh, let's start with the verse seven for the sake of time. Let's just go to a few of some other examples. Uh, let's go to, I, I don't know if you wanna write these down too. Ecclesiastes 1.13, I got, 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 12, Titus 2, 12. Uh, let's go to Hebrews 5, 14, though, and read that in context. Hebrews 5, 14. I might actually get done with this. I feel like I'm speaking quicker than I usually do. <laughs> Hebrews 5, 14. But strong meat belongs to them that are, full, that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And down to 1211. Hebrews 1211.
Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous, nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And then uh, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I had some of these other verses that would pertain to spiritual exercising as well, but they'll be discussed more further later in, uh, um, in the lesson. Now with verse 8, let's turn to just a few examples in Scripture about some religious exercise. Uh, Isaiah 1, verse 11. So like what Ernie said, uh, Old Testament citing. <laughs> Isaiah 1, verse 11. And just the top half for to read. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says the Lord. And then drop down to verse 13. Bring no more vain oblations, Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointment, appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when, you, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. And then also, for the sake of time, read Matthew 23 on your own, uh, because again, it goes into Jesus condemning the behaviors of the scribes and the Pharisees and the, the religious exercises and things like that that they do. Um, but then also Colossians 2. Two twenty through twenty three. Where if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things and to have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship. Uh, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in, um, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So again, if you look at that again, it's the bodily exercise part that does have some profit. He's not discounting it. There is a show of some wisdom behind some of that, right? Um, it's just a, it's a discipline that we do, we exert, so we, again, we have to work at it, right? To do some of that stuff, because uh, what do they say of that a lot of times for habits? Is it easy to make a habit, or is it hard to make a habit? And then is it also easy to break a habit, or is it hard to break a habit? Does it take work to do any of that? <laughs> and some of it may take it a lot easier. Um, I know for when I was getting off drugs, it was easy for me. Getting off smoking, I shouldn't say that. Let me, let me rephrase that. <laughs> to get off drugs was not easy. I was still at rehab and all that stuff. But I had the will in me, in that sense, that was before Christ, to stop. But smoking? Holy cow. That was the hardest thing for me to even quit because that was based on habit. That was waking up. That was after dinner. That was driving a car. That was break time. That was uh, stress. That was going before bed. That was, you, you look at all these different things you do every day. Now you've got to fill that void. So I started basically eating, started uh, 
put in a, um, like tuned gum, things like that. And so when I got off of drugs and all that, I weighed, a, first I weighed 125 pounds. And you could see skin and bone in that. Got off some smoking too and started eating. And I gained it with drugs and smoking on that. I gained up to 230 pounds in two months. So again, all that fill in the void, <laughs> some of those things, I had to discipline myself to then lose that weight, which then took work, took exercise to do all that. But it did, it took a lot of exertion on behind my part to do. Um, but again, this is all fleshly exercises. So we're doing fasting, fleshly exercise. Still, show some wisdom behind it. There is still some of that behind, right? That's, it's smart to do. Um, you're doing it for good reasons. It's a good discipline, things like that, which exercising is. It's a good, healthy discipline. So, and I believe, again, so now even though he was talking about religious practices in some of those verses, I believe in verse 8, and again, you can disagree with if you want to, we can still take that principle of bodily exercise and apply it to the physical exertion we do and make in this life. So that's not what he's talking about is exercising, you know, bodybuilding, lifting weights, uh, high intense training, whatever it might be. He's not physically talking about that. He's talking more for the uh, disciplines we do on just like that of what he talks about is abstaining, fasting, purifying, things like that. There's a show of that wisdom. So in essence, if you go again to Blue Letter Bible, you'll see an outline biblical usage of the word exercise. Um, for that particular Greek word for and now for the first usage it gives for it is the exercise of the body in a palestra. Is that am I, am I pronouncing that right? Palestra or school of athletics, which when I did some research on Roman Greek gymnasiums. Adult males were the only ones allowed to use them, and you exercise and completed it naked. Now, their definition of naked, that I don't know fully yet, whether that was fully, or whether they, again, they had the undergarment and just protect and kind of um, uh, covering that private area, I'm going to say. So you don't see that here in America, though, right? Um, unless some nudist colony or something is out there that they might be doing, I don't know. Um, but which they said it was a practice which um, encouraged ascetic appreciation of the male body and to be a tribute to their Roman mythical gods. So it was also a place they went to engage each other in intellectual, scholarly, philosophical pursuits. Uh, a modern day example of some of that might be where you look at the bodybuilding competitions. I don't know if you guys have ever watched some of those or seen those. Again. Arnold, that's what he made, they made his name. It was uh, the, uh, the bodybuilding competitions, Mr. Universe, right? You got it, basically it's all oiled up and everything like that, and they got this little skimpy thing that covers a certain areas. Um, but it is showing the aesthetics, the, the form, male form of the body, and basically it's not, wasn't to be always to get the strongest, because there is a strongman competition, but it was to show the forms the muscles that are on your body and working all the different muscles and then having it all in this uniform, uh, basically um, almost like an art. If you look at it, it's like an art where you're trying to get that, that muscle to look exactly like this one too, but have it form. So you're looking at that, again, that male appreciation that uh, the body, and, and again, there's women competitions as well, same thing, it's, it's, but in that day, women weren't allowed to. So in the bottom, oops, sorry, this was a picture I found online of the uh, Pompeii, is that how you pronounce that, Pompeii Gymnasium, uh, from the top of the stadium wall. So if you look at it again, it's, this is some of the, uh, uh, a visual then of what their gymnasiums uh, would have looked like. And so Paul would have seen some of these places going into Athens. So this is not the same as for what he went into in Mars Hill. At first I'm thinking going, is this what he went into? Did he go to, because if you look at it, what they did is intellectual, scholarly, and philosophical pursuits. Was this something where he, you know, they wanted to learn something new, they debated, they did things like that, different beliefs. So that was not the same thing as what these are. Um, so the second part of the biblical usage, so on this point, I, I circled in a different color so you could see the difference. Uh, 
is it any type of exercise, whatever. So let's turn quickly to some other verses that Paul brings up about the exercising of our bodies. So 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 13. First Corinthians 6, verse 12 through 13. Oh man, you must have All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. These are one of the verses I was actually really close to putting on. I have a tattoo on my arm, and it's got verses, and it, it keeps me in focused. Because any time that if I'm feeling down and out or feeling something that I, uh, um, again, have anxiety or something like that, there's no way I can get away from that because my arm is going to be always out somewhere. And it, it's a good conversation starter. So, But this was one of the verses I was going to put because of that issue in the past, my, part of my testimony. I am not going to let that have any power over me again, is the stuff that I was under then. But again, that would be a flesh a exercise. That would be some wisdom behind that, <laughs> some discipline and things like that. So I do things to try to keep myself, again, I will not be the power of any. So meats for the belly, and let's sorry, continue on to 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Uh, and then drop down to verse 19 and go to 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not of your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're stewards of our own body too, right? So we need to take care of our own bodies as well. Um, if you can know uh, if a couple pages, go to chapter 9. So, you know, what you have on that. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that ye may obtain. I don't run, just FYI. I don't run. I walk, I do that, but I don't run. Um, and my wife will say that same thing. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, uh, we are an incorruptible. Therefore, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. But I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Again, that's a powerful verses right there. Again, as for <laughs> that body, that, that, that striving to um, obtain the prize, and what, but what was he uh, on that sense of trying to obtain? Was he trying to do a body? Uh, to, uh, to, was he trying to run, just like in a race? No, we were trying to do, he's trying to do something different. And that uh, is a bodily race for a, a prize or, or a medal around her neck, right? Um, and then uh, let's go to, 10 verse 23 real quick chapter 10 verse 23 all things are lawful for me but all things are not expedient all things are lawful for me but all things edify not and then down to verse 31 whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do do all to the glory of God so there was a picture I was going to have up in here and then I found and it's going to be my kind of my sense of profile but it was a gym type thing, and it was saying is that we can go to the gym, leave our stresses and things like that, but those stresses could be right back at it when we leave the gym. Yeah, they could be. Who do we go to for our stresses? Who do we go to for our struggles and our anxiety and all that? We need to go to Christ. Our focus needs to be on Christ again. So, which I'm going to go further into the other explanation of again of we're exercising what are we exercising of exercise thyself unto what mm -hmm. godliness so what is that godliness though and we'll go into that so what does it mean um uh mean by godliness and again how will it profit us more Oh, the timing on this is not 
mess with all again the whole <laughs> stuff. So when I started getting into the guidelines part of the study, I will just uh, before I get into further, I was overwhelmed. I don't know if uh, again some of you uh, may have watched my one on anger and emotions. You go into emotions and try to study that, that takes you all over the place. It is an overwhelming subject and to go into a, yeah, you can go into the more philosophical and the worldly understanding of emotions, but then you can get into the spiritual side and then try to combine it all. Oh man, I didn't know what I got myself into. Um, but same thing, when I started looking up godliness and started trying to correlate that exercise, that was kind of easy on that point, I found. <laughs> but godliness has that same open door on that point. It takes you all these rabbit trails, all these other different verses. So there's a lot of verses I'm probably not even going to be going to um, because I need to be able to focus, my, have my focus on just the exercise and godliness part. So as much as going further and you're doing your own study and looking into godliness and what the verses, all that can uh, mean, and I, I encourage you to do that um, on your own as well. Um, but there's a lot of curves in the road, and so that's what I'm gonna focus on. So the first picture, which were these two. Um, now quickly, let's look at the word godliness. So when looking up exact word godliness, it occurs 15 times in 15 verses, and is also translated holiness once. Uh, next picture, the bottom one, is there are two Greek words used for godliness according to Strong. So if you don't use exact word, you will find three, which will refer to a sebia, which will be regarded to ungodliness, ungodly. So again, what's the opposite of godliness? Ungodliness. What's the opposite of uh, godly? Ungodly. So you're going to have a different word usage again. Um, the ones highlighted in yellow use eusebia, which includes the one from X. Acts 3.12, okay, and it's not doing what it. The one highlighted in pink uses Thessobia and is used once in 1 Timothy 2.10. This right here is the definition for uh, godliness from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Notice that it references 1 Timothy 4.7. Again, as for, and I don't know if we remind you, Webster's references are from the King James Bible. Uh, so they're not from any other translation, they're not from that, it's, they're from the King James Bible. So to look at that, when you find the word godliness and it refers to it, you're going to go to that verse and you're going to see that word on that point. Um, and so for the first one, and, and also 1 Timothy 3.16 as well for the uh, second one right here. And then also notice the root word of where it's coming from, godly. So I added that one as well, even though godly is not in the verses, our focused verses of what we're talking about. So let's now look at a few of those scriptures from the list that would pertain to godliness. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. 2 1 Timothy 2, verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So for us to pray for all those in authority that they choose to make laws such as to the body of Christ, so that we may live our Christian lives according to his word in peace and honesty and in reverence um, and love for our Lord. So godliness. 1 Timothy 2.10 but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So women adorning them themselves, that shows their personal love and reverence toward God. Godliness, again. 1 Timothy 3.16, which I'll tell you right now, I am not going to go into so far into this one. Because I believe there might be more to this verse than meets the eye. So it's not just speaking primarily of Christ and Paul's revelations and doctrine and things like that to that, but also about the concept of the godliness part. If you look at the mystery of godliness, of uh, what we will be going into, you look at the, also to the mystery of iniquity. You're seeing those two phrases, mystery of iniquity, and you've got mystery of godliness. 
I think there's more to it than just that the revelations and the doctrines and uh, it's the systematic. If you look at it, the systematic, um, I think it was in here. Uh, and of course it's not, I don't have it. Sorry, it was in part of my other uh, when I was notes that I had. Um, but it's the systematic part of the Christian uh, faith on that point. If you first to Timothy 3.16, I think there's more to it. I encourage you to study it on your own. Tell me what your thoughts are too on that beyond it, what that godliness part in there. Um, 1 Timothy 6, verse 3 through 6. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doubting about questions and strifes of words, whereof comes envy, strife, railings, evil surmivings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw yourself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Speaking of teachers of people, <coughs> it can show that forms of godliness, um, but denying the true power, uh, or I'm sorry, went a little beyond, um, but godliness, uh, that possession, material possessions and money shows a form of godliness, and that you are in favor with God is by that gain. So that they're showing that there's another uh, point of that. Not seeking after, but thankful for what you have is of great gain. Which is, he says in verse 11 of that same chapter, is to follow righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, all those things. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 5. 2 Timothy 3, 5. I'm sorry, I'm kind of rushing a little more because now I see my time is almost getting close. Mm -hmm. um, I might have to skip some stuff. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. I'll kind of talk a little bit more on a later time. Speaking of teachers or people that can show forms of godliness, but denying the true power of God, the power of the gospel. Um, religion has a form of godliness, but it does not know Christ. Um, they have the form, but it's not the reality. It's not the truth. It's not a truth. Um, Titus 1, 1 through 2. Titus 1, 1 through 2. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, and hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Uh, Paul correlates godliness with an acknowledging of the truth. Remember what uh, 2 Timothy 3, 3, 5 said, talked about. Many have a zeal and profess godliness, but if not according to the knowledge of the truth as in Christ, it is empty and powerless. Um, and then last, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 8. Oh boy. Yeah, I kind of figured the time would be like, you know, from 20 minutes to two hours long. I didn't know what. I thought I pinpointed around that amount. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 8. According to it, as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And if, or if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I wanted to read that because I actually wrote that down, wrote it, and put it on the mirror. And just again, I'll get into further why, uh, <laughs> if we can. Um, to, so again, if we are to look at godliness, we are to see that it comes from the word godly in the first place. Now we'll also look at the word as in both definitions of godliness and godly. godly. Piety. And you got pious. The 1828 Webster's Dictionary of the word piety in principle is a compound of veneration or reverence of the supreme being and love of his character, 
or veneration accompanied with love and piety and practice is the exercise of these affections in obedience to his will and devotion to his service. So again, it's an, uh, more of an understanding of what godliness is um, and where it's coming from and things like that. And reverence of, company with affection and devotion to uh, their honor. So it's whether your parents is a, uh, one of the verses, it says reverence of parents or friends, but it also can be to God himself, uh, that company with affection and devotion to their honor. We want to do this for the glory of God. Do we want to do this for the glory of ourselves? Is that what we're doing it for? No, we're doing this for the glory of God. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to do that part. Uh, uh, just if you can read really quick, turn to 1 Timothy 1 4. That if you look at that, it sounds familiar to chapter 4, verse 7. But again, look at that part, godly edifying, which is in faith. Um, I don't know if you guys want to take a notes or anything like that, just to kind of write these verses down, because um, I just we don't have time. 2 Timothy 3.12, it's straight and to the point. It's sincere godliness from believers convicts the loss, so they will either respond to it and trust Christ for salvation when the truth, the truth is given to them, or like we probably see more days now, they'll react with hate, anger, hatred, hostility, um, and sometimes even possibly violence. Um, which again, we're seeing in these latter days. Titus 2.12, that's another one. Again, what's the opposite of godliness? Ungodliness. So the grace of God teaches us to deny or refuse the world and live godly in this present world. Uh, what's in the world? Well, if you turn to John, 1 John 2.16, what's in the world? Real quick, that's an easy verse. 1 John 2.16, we probably have all heard it know it. I'm not good at memorization. Again, that's an exercise that I need to try to do more on. 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Um... You can put that together with the bodily exercise again. Let's examine ourselves um, again when our affections and where our affections and devotion is. Um, now, for the sake of time, let's put all this together and see what profit that spiritual exercising unto godliness will have in this life and the life to come. And the last slide. Let's see if I can get through this. Um, this is where I I was basically almost gonna. I had some things happen, I was telling them this morning, I had some things happen uh, this week that I was about to um, delay this whole thing again because it happened on the same day and I was able to try to put all this together as fast as possible. I didn't try to do my full due diligence, but it's more of a conclusion based on the understanding of it. So if some things are a little bit more disorganized, please forgive me and <laughs> get the best of whatever you can. Uh, um, so, in my opinion, based on verse 1, I feel strongly we are living in the last days of the dispensation of grace. Again, verse 1, if you look at in the latter days. Um, and whether or not the rapture will happen in my lifetime or not, or in ours, then exercising ourselves to godliness will help no matter in these days or in the decades to come. Um, and are filled, because again, we're filled with profane fables, seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Uh, godliness in the list that Peter gives in 2 Peter, again, if you remember that uh, list that he gave um, in, one through, in chapter 1, verses through, through, 3 through 8, of what to add to our faith, I believe are in the ones that Paul talks about in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, again, the fruits of the Spirit. I think those are two different types of lists. Uh, Paul's list is what the Holy Spirit produces in our lives as we renew our minds and walk in the Spirit and on the flesh. And Peter's list is what we exercise and are practicing and adding to our faith. Again, um, I'm going to put uh, the slides up again. So understanding, again, the, the verb usage and the noun usage on the word exercise and how those two and the definitions based on that and how you can see the different 
in those definitions, there's uh, common phrases that are used in each one. And then you can correlate that with the ones from uh, verse 7 and also verse 8 in chapter 4. So we as Christ's ambassadors must keep ourselves fit, physically, mentally, and spiritually, but appropriately on the right nourishment and exercise. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. Exercising equals getting fit. Getting fit, that means you're growing. Uh, if you notice when reading the word, the Holy Spirit uses a lot of refer words that refer to the body, in which we can also see in exercise, health, walk, stand, body in itself, fight, exercise, word exercise again, train, edifying, nourish. As you talk about each person as being a member of the body, right? So again, there's a lot of correlation uh, with those words and then putting it all together, you can um, kind of do your own study on that. But physical growth and spiritual growth are very similar. Growth only comes with exertion and with proper feeding. Um, isn't walking a form of physical exercise? It's a parallel to a form of spiritual exercise as well. Hence, walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Uh, so like in verse six, you are then walking as a good minister of Christ, which, again, up here. Uh, exercise involves use, practice, discipline, and suffering, being active, pain, growth. Verse 10 talks about suffering approach, which we can see in 2 Timothy 3.12. Living godly in this present world, we shall suffer persecution. So how does it have that profit for this life and life to come? Godliness and truth won't make this life that now is the most comfortable, richest, or easiest, but the Holy Spirit does and shows and gives us a more excellent way. Uh, if you want to write these verses down, we don't have time to go to them. Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. Philippians 3, verse 8. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Titus 3, verse 8. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. In 1 John 2, 25, which can also be talking about the life that which is to come, being made in the image of his Son. Godliness for that which is to come. This is a list I found online that was short and to the point of why godliness over bodily exercise is more profitable. Sin and vice offer nothing light for the life to come. Bloodline and heritage offer nothing for the life to come. Worldly success and wealth offer nothing for the life to come. Personal fame and fleshly beauty offer nothing for the life to come. Achievements and learning of sports offer nothing for the life to come. So if you turn to chapter 6, verses 6 or 7, for we brought nothing into the world, it is certain we can carry nothing out. Have any of you heard, okay, real quick, have you ever heard, of, uh, anybody heard the speech from the 1990s from John Scolinos? It's a huge thing, I got introduced to it and I was like blown away by this because I talked to the kids about it and now my kid wants to do a devotion at his homeschool link group to teach everybody else about it. Short, so this is why I have this up here. If you guys know baseball and that, um, it's called basically 17 inch wide. The home plate is 17 inches wide. It's about no matter what league, little, minors, major, doesn't matter where you go, what era in baseball you're in, home plate is always 17 inches. And when a pitcher can't throw the ball over that 17 inches, do they ask him what he needs to be able to throw it over the plate? Do they need to widen the plate for him? It goes on with us some other examples. So I'm basically short in the big time. Um, basically, do they change the rules to fit him? Or do they hold these players accountable? His point gets to that all parts of society, government, schools, sports, churches, families, etc. They keep widening the plate and not keeping ourselves and people accountable. They widen the plate of accountability and responsibility. I encourage you guys to look up and read that whole speech. It is, it is an excellent speech, what he does. Are we doing the same? Are we compromising by widening the plate of God's standards to allow the deceptions of the world, the devil, and our own fleshly desires and ambitions be exercised in our lives and affect the lives and world around us. God forbid. Romans 6.21, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? And also Romans 12.1-2. through 2. 
Let ourselves not widen the plate and be that, like that list in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5, about all these things about having that form of godliness, but denying the power of. Let's set our standards and focus and affections, again, that's godliness, on what God says in, in his word that is always unchanging, relevant, and absolute which the exercising of godliness that will have that profit that now is into those around us. So we, as we believe and trust the gospel of our salvation and are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise and the one true living God and Savior Jesus Christ, those around us will also do the same, which is a profit to them for the life to come. And as verse 9 says, and a few other places as well, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Exercising into godliness is as true today as it was back then. Let us keep fighting the good fight of faith and godliness till the end of our life or until the Lord comes. Okay, I did make it through. We had to skip a lot, actually. <laughs> but I want to thank you guys all for coming. And so, um, as much as still nerve-wracking, I didn't get out. It's a lot of stuff that I probably wanted to get out, but I made it a point, too. I told Joel and I told Pastor that there's not going to be enough time for questions and answering. So, <laughs> I made a point of that. <laughs> so, if you, if you guys have anything of comments or questions or opinions on it, of anything of what I said or what, please come to me and we can talk about it, though. Um, but thank you again for everybody for coming. So, it is just after 10 now. Thank you. Thank you.